If you know just one thing about herpes viruses, it's probably that once you get infected by one, you have it for life. Which obviously stinks in many ways. After all, these viruses are behind things like mono, chickenpox, and shingles, infectious blindness, and even some cancers. But it turns out that they might also be kind of good for you. Having herpes may protect you from things that have nothing to do with herpes. And that's because herpes virus infections do something immunologists have only recently realized was even possible. They train your first-line immune defenses. Now, we've known for a very long time that the human immune system can remember pathogens and launch a better counter-assault if they dare show up again. That's thanks to the adaptive immune system, the arm of the immune system that includes things like antibodies. But apparently, your innate immune system can learn from experiences as well. That's the arm of the immune system that spots infectious agents to begin with and takes a first stab at kicking them to the curb. And for more than a century, scientists didn't think it could remember anything let alone use that memory to adapt how it responds to threats. I mean, it's right there in the names. Innate versus adaptive. In fact, the idea it can remember and adapt is so new that the term for it, trained immunity, was only proposed in 2011. The innate immune system doesn't remember specific attackers like the adaptive immune system does. Basically, it just remembers that bad guys exist and that they could come after you at any time like they've done before. But this is probably enough to alter how well you fight off a potentially deadly infection. And apparently, one way to get this trained immunity is with a little help from a herpes virus. Herpes viruses are members of the herpes viridae family, eight of which infect humans. And they're everywhere. The odds of you getting at least one in your lifetime is pretty high. Two-thirds of young people in the world probably have herpes simplex 1, for instance, the virus behind cold sores and some cases of genital herpes. And they'll have it forever, because herpes viruses can do something few viruses can. They can hunker down inside cells and remain dormant for long periods of time. And this is where the immune training idea comes in. Studies suggest that while herpes viruses are hanging out in their hosts, they can help the immune system fight off deadlier pathogens. See, while latent infections generally aren't attacked like active ones, they don't go totally unnoticed by your immune system. So because they're there, your innate immune system essentially keeps its bouncers on high alert. That high alert state is your trained immunity, and experimental research in mice suggests it could save your life. In a 2007 study, researchers exposed mice to two different bacteria, Yersinia pestis, aka the plague, and Listeria monocytogenes, which causes very serious foodborne infections. Mice that were latently infected with mouse versions of herpes viruses were resistant to both bacteria. That's all in mice, of course, but there are clues that human herpes viruses confer similar benefits. Like, when researchers looked at the immune cell of people with latent infections of the herpes virus CMV, they saw changes consistent with trained immunity. Specifically, they found differences in the participants' natural killer cells, immune cells awesomely named because they recognize and kill infected cells. In infected participants, these cells produced more interferon gamma, a protein which helps your immune system to keep an eye out for trouble. And researchers think heightened state of vigilance could last up to a few years after a latent infection starts. So while herpes viruses hide in our bodies, they may also help those bodies stay alive longer. Which, from an evolutionary perspective, makes sense for the virus, too since it can't replicate inside dead cells. Now, trained immunity may not always be a good thing. Researchers think that it could go awry and lead to autoimmunity, the immune system attacking a person's own tissues. Still, it's probably pretty useful a lot of the time, and further research on the phenomenon could really help people. Like, eventually, studying herpes could teach scientists how to give people trained immunity without the viral infection. In fact, some preliminary research suggests certain vaccines are already doing this. I will be presenting especially immunological work that tries to understand what is the molecular and immunologic, immunological basis of the nonspecific effects that have been observed during the years. And my interest and in how, how we started to work on that approximately 10 years ago is when we have understood from the literature that BCG might have some very interesting, nonspecific, and 
potentially beneficial effects in various groups of individuals who have been vaccinated. And this is one of the first observations which was done by Karl Neslund, the doctor who was introducing BCG in, in Sweden and who observed that mortality in children between zero and four years old after the introduction of BCG was decreasing very strongly. And that was not to be explained by the TB uh, uh, itself, which was responsible only for less than 1% of the deaths. And this observation has been made time and again, each time that BCG was introduced, either in Europe, United States, South America. Later on, these are studies that have been uh, down, uh, done in, in Africa, which have observed the same thing that in instance of high infectious pressure when child mortality is high and most of uh, the most important uh, cause of death in, in these children is infection, BCG vaccination can significantly down, uh, reduce the mortality. Also want to point out, for example, the study with BCG revaccination that has been published very, uh, very recently, less than uh, two years ago, one and a half years ago, in which people didn't even followed the, the, uh, in the study, the, the aim was not to identify the nonspecific effects, but even when they tracked the rate of upper respiratory tract infection, for example, you can see here that the BCG group had a much lower um, uh, prevalence of respiratory tract infections compared with the other groups that they have been studied in this manuscript. So all of this brings us to a from the immunological point of view, brings us to a problem. And why is that? Because we generally tend to divide the uh, immune responses, the host defense, into two components, which is the innate immune response and adaptive immune response. And the innate immune response is rapid, effective, is what is happening in the first couple of hours and days after an infection, when we scratch um, the skin and we get a local infection, or we inhale some, uh, some pathogens, usually we have uh, innate immune cells such as monocytes, macrophages locally, uh, which inject and destroy the, the mi microorganisms. They, they go to the place of the infection, they do chemotaxis, they phagocytose and they kill the microorganism. And this is supposed to be pretty much the same every time it is happening. And it also is supposed to lack immunological memory. So every time we, you, you do the same. And it is very effective. It's true 99% of the, of the Infections are very easily eliminated in that way. In the other small percentage that that is not the case and infection persists, then the real smart part of the immunity, uh, the of immune response is B and T cells, which can recognize specific antigens come into play. They proliferate, specifically specific clones proliferate, which recognize the antigen. And thereafter, after contraction, after the infection has been eliminated, memory cells remain. And that is the substrate of vaccines, that is what we have aimed always to do, is to build immunological memory by building T and B cell memory cells. Now all is fine, but if we look from an evolutionary point of view at these processes, at immunological memory in general, we, un we understand that something is a little bit strange. And the strange thing is the fact that only 5% of all species on Earth, only the vertebrates have T and B cells. All the other 95% uh, of the species don't. They only have innate immune responses, which would mean that immunological memory, the ability to store this information and use it when it's needed, has evolved apparently only in a very small percentage of the species on Earth, which is kind of strange because, for example, the eye has evolved multiple times. The eye of an insect or the eye of a mammal are very different, but they serve the same function, to look for food or to escape predators or whatever. But it is very necessary, it's very advantageous. That's why it evolved many times, which is called convergent evolution. So is it possible that we do not have convergent evolution? There is no immunological memory which evolved in other 95% of the species and only evolved in the, uh, in the vertebrates. And by the way, evolved twice in the vertebrates because we have also in jawless uh, vertebrates, Max Cooper's work, showed beautifully that there is a different type of uh, adaptive immunity, which is not based on immunoglobulins, but on VLR molecules. But if we look at the literature, actually, and this is an old paper already, and a, a very old table, all, almost 10 years old, and now there are many more examples, that is not the case. If we infect a plant with a virus or a fungus and the plant doesn't die, it becomes more resistant to that. It even transmits the resistance for up to three or four generations, actually, through epigenetic processes, through seeds. 
There are also many examples now of non-vertebrates being able to adapt to a previous infection, respond better and become more resistant to that, which they should not be able to if only lymphocytes are able to develop that memory. Even old studies that have been published more than 20, 25 years ago have shown that in certain uh, models of vaccination, vaccinated a severe combined immunodeficiency mice, a skid mice, which does not have functional PMB cells, can partially protect. BCG could protect, for example, against candidiasis in a skid mice. So that was something very interesting. And it was something that was supporting through experimental studies the observation of non-specific effects that has been made uh, epidemiologically. It's important to be said, these are metabolic processes, epigenetic processes. They're not recognizing a certain antigens or whatever. And that's why even you, if you encounter a different pathogen, the cell will respond better. So it is not antigen specific. This is the, one of the first proof of principle studies that we have done almost 10 years ago now, in which we vaccinated uh, healthy volunteers in the Netherlands with BCG, and they kindly donated blood before and after. And then we re-stimulated their cells. These are just blood PBMCs with MTB, Staph aureus, or Candida albicans. So BCG is present for a month, basically, in the skin. It's releasing a lot of muramil D peptides, and the way actually it, it activates cells, it activates immune responses are quite different in terms of breadth of uh, receptors which are engaged. It's very different from a, uh, a non-life recombinant vaccines. And you can see here, this is what we would expect because the gamma interferon production from memory T cells should be higher and so on. And it is. But also the stimulation of gamma interferon by Staph aureus or Candida albicans, which are have nothing to do with the BCG vaccination is also better. But when we purify and we take the monocytes from in these individuals and we stimulate them, and the monocytes are not supposed, let's say, uh, theoretically from the immunology books, to have a different uh, functional profile after the, uh, the vaccination, but still, we can see that in reality, this is different. The monocytes after the vaccination are responding better to stimulation also independently of the stimulus, MTB, Staph aureus, Candida albicans. These changes are not as strong as, as in the T cells, which is to be understood because they don't proliferate in the same way that the T cells do and so on, but is clearly upregulated 50 to uh, uh, sometimes to 80%. Can we prove now that these effects can protect the individual against a controlled infection in humans? So what kind of infection should we do? And we actually have done two, but the first one was a model of viral infection in which we actually used the yellow fever vaccination as a model of a mild viral infection because this is an attenuated virus and we can follow the viremia with a simple PCR in the blood. And 15 healthy volunteers got BCG, other 15 got placebo, all of them got one month later yellow fever vaccine, and we followed the viremia in the circulation. This is on day three, only a couple of volunteers had viremia. This is on day seven, the vast majority of the individuals eliminated the virus, which should happen. But on day five, almost everybody had viruses in the blood. But the individuals who had BCG, who had been previously vaccinated with BCG, clearly had lower amounts of virus in the circulation. Interestingly enough, and against my expectation, I would have expected that this is associated with the capacity of the cells to improve their interferon production, either type 1 or type 2 interference, which have very well-known antiviral effects. But we were not able to observe any relationship between the interferon, either alpha or beta production capacity, and the elimination of the virus from the cir circulation. On the other hand, the capacity of the monocytes to produce interleukin-1-beta or IL-6 was very strongly associated with the capacity of the organism to eliminate the virus. So the better the people were able to increase their IL-1-beta production to non-specific stimuli such as Staph aureus or Candida or MTB also, but LPS a little bit less, uh, less well correlated. But anyway, the capacity to improve the production of R1 beta to non-specific stimuli was very strongly associated with lower viruses in the circulation. So we demonstrated that that is possible. We have also shown that these cells, these myeloid cells, monocytes, in the circulation respond differently two weeks and three months later 
but there is a problem in that because monocytes are in the circulation only for two or three days. So how is it possible that two weeks later and three months later even, and we have done some studies one year later, they are still different? Well, the only possible explanation would be if similar type of changes happen also in the bone marrow progenitors of the myeloid cells. And this is a very nice study which was published by the group of Mas Divangahi uh, two years ago now, in which he showed precisely that in the mice, hematopoietic stem cells and monocyte progenitors go strongly up. And he also beauty, he did beautiful studies of hematopoietic stem cells and monocyte progenitors which go strongly up. He did beautiful studies of transplanting uh, bone marrow from the BCG vaccinated individual, um, not individuals, but mice, into, into Reg1 deficient mice who have a defective adaptive immune response. They don't have functional TMB cells. And he was able to see actually that these mice were better able to, to deal with a tuberculosis infection. We ourselves were interested in another very interesting immunological and, and uh, pathophysiological process that has been described actually in the 60s in a nuclear submarine in the US. So these were the submarines which NATO still has basically, which have to stay for three or four months on the bottom of the ocean. If an enemy attacks uh, US or UK or whatever, they would, and they would destroy the capacities, the launching capacities on, on the soil. They are supposed actually to attack and revenge uh, um, uh, US against the enemy. So the problem was that you are closed in a very small environment with some 30 guys there. And if one of them got open TB, you are in trouble. And also because of the protocols, you are not just going, okay, now we are going up and uh, bring uh, the person to a hospital. You really have to stay there for three four, or four months. And that's exactly what was happening with these sailors, actually. But it was something very interestingly that was observed. And this process that was described initially in these people on the nuclear submarine has been observed every time that people were exposed closely to patients with open TB. So what is that? Well, somebody has a TB and then starts to in infect people in the house, uh, their family, and so on. Well, there are some people who were already exposed and, okay, we are not going to discuss about those individuals. But from the people who were previously uninfected, you will have a couple of, the, you will have two groups. You, you will have somebody who's uninfected but it acquires infection but remains latent, uh, latent, or it becomes sick, or, but very interestingly, there are a number of individuals, and in the case of the guys from the submarine, submarine I think there were initially 60 or so uh, inside, and some 10 of them, they never got the disease, but they never got a positive skin test, which is kind of strange. It's, as if they were never exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, although they have stayed in a very small, confined environment with somebody with open TB. But this group of individuals, which are called early clearers or resistors, there is a minority of the individuals, and depending on the, on the cohort, is 20 to 30%, that they never get sick, but they never get latent TB, and they never convert. So their T cells don't respond, actually, although these individuals have been exposed. So we were interested in this process and to understand what is happening. So the conclusion of, uh, of all these studies was that BCG vaccination can lead to nonspecific protection against unrelated infection. And I'm not talking now about the epidemiology, but purely of controlled uh, human infections. I showed you data on yellow fever vaccine viremia, but we have published last year also on experimental human malaria in which people got a plasmodium falciparum in experimental infection and 50% of them were protected at the level of parasitemia. This is most likely due to in induction of uh, trained immunity or an increased capacity of the, uh, to deal with the microorganism. This was due to long-term reprogramming at the level of myeloid cell progenitors, which produced uh, different amounts of myeloid cells. And this is also very likely responsibly, at least partly, for induction of innate immunity-dependent early clearance. Now, we started the entire discussion based on the evolutionary argument that, evolutionary speaking, is most likely that 
innate immunity must have also an adaptation because otherwise it would not make sense that 95% of all organisms on Earth do not have immunological memory. And we wanted also to know, can we prove actually that this process of trained immunity or improved responses is likely to be important evolutionary. And the, our conclusion is that very likely, evolutionarily speaking, immune memory has evolved in two important steps. And there was one initial step to improve, to increase the amplitude of the response, the speed and the amplitude of the response. And this is based on epigenetic uh, mechanisms. And those are important for both myelin cells, but also for TMB cells. And this is a very primitive form, non-specific, uh, antigen-independent form of immune memory, which is present in all organisms. And Evolutionarily speaking, there was an innovation in, in vertebrates, and maybe I, I cannot be sure that there is undiscovered adaptive immunity in other organisms, but at least we know from the vertebrates that we have immunoglobulin-based or, or VLR-based adaptive immune memory that give also specificity to the response, but this is only in vertebrates. Why are we not evolutionarily already trained? If that is positive, why not? I think that uh, we are born in a tolerant state, and that is the price that we pay for a successful pregnancy. Because during the pregnancy, the mother does, should, not, uh, should not reject uh, uh, the child. And, and it has been shown that, that mothers with very strong T helper 1 responses, for example, to talk about that, are more likely to have spontaneous abort abortions. So basically, th there is a very com reg uh, complex regulation that nobody understands yet, or at least that I know, what is happening in the, in the pregnancy. Because, for example, the mother is perfectly fine to have the child in the womb for nine months, not having an abortus and, and so on. But if later on in the life the mother has a problem with a kidney and it should receive a kidney from the same child who was in her womb, and she would get that kidney, she would reject that kidney very quickly if it's not properly treated and so on. And nobody understands how one is possible and not the other. So, I, I think this is the price that we pay, being born tolerant, because mother has to be tolerant, and then the fetus is then also tolerant. We are born tolerant, and we have to be trained thereafter.